Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power. Hi guys and welcome to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, a weekly show about all things Port Adelaide Footy Club. I'm your host, Macca19, and joining me as always, we've got co-host Fishing Rick. How are you, mate? I'm disappointed, Macca. Oh, it's, uh, why? It was rough. I, I went to the game on on Saturday. I wasn't expected to go, but I, I sort of snuck in there. Oh, good yeah, I did make it, and which was a great thing. But the day before, I went out for my office and bought all these reams of paper because I, I thought it was on special and uh, I thought I'd load up for tax season on its way and then buddy, I go to the game on Saturday and the umpire is just offering out free reams all the time because we got friggin' reamed <laughs> by the umpire. <laughs> if I knew that, I would have just waited next day. <laughs> yeah. Good hey, that's got to be, be my best joke for the year so far. Come on. Yeah, it's up there. It's up there. I, I worked hard for that one. Days. It's, it's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> not, not great. I'll give you good, but not great. It's getting there. Doing Harsh well. judge. <laughs> Harsh judge. And back on the podcast for the second time, we've got Harold Oliver. How are you, mate? I'm great. Great to be great here, to guys. Have you back on. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Just hope uh, Rick's jokes improve. No, <laughs> That's one of the good ones. One, one and only for tonight. All right, so let's get into our love and hate, which is one thing we loved, one thing we hated in and around the Port Adelaide Footy Club this week. Harold, mate, because you're the guest, we'll start with you, buddy. Oh, thanks. Um, there's all, certainly a lot to love about Port Adelaide this week. Absolutely. Whether it's uh, Darren Burgess's contract extension until 2018. Yep. Jay Shules, of course, you know, equaling Tread Ray's goal-kicking record. Um, Jacko's contract extension announced yep. today. Jared Pollock's sent appearance. Gather, fend off, exchange with Wingard, goal on the run. It was a beauty. Hoth's mark in the first quarter on the members' wing. Did I mention Jay Schulz? I, th- I think you did. Yep. <laughs> no, I think my... Oh, Tango wants you to hurry up. Okay. <laughs> no, my love is definitely that this is the year of the end of the hoodoo. The Frio hoodoo's ended. Hawthorne hoodoo gone. Geelong hoodoo ended. Uh, and we haven't beaten the dogs uh, since round 19, 2006, losing the past seven games until last Saturday. Yep. Bulldogs hoodoo ended. And I think it's about time we started creating hoodoos of our own again. Indeed. And actually, I really, really love Jay Shaw's. Yes. Yeah, he's got... so what about your hate, mate? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go with the pretty obvious hate. Well, I think it's pretty obvious. It's the AFL score review system. It was so disappointing to realise that the central umpire wasn't bouncing the ball after Corns' second goal because a review was taking place. I couldn't believe it. You know, I was even ignorant of the fact that the video review umpire could even call for a review. And then we got to see, you know, countless replays, and I know my eyesight is not what it once was, but surely the video evidence was inconclusive. So surely, you know, the goal umpire's original call and, in fact, every umpire on the field's original call should have stood. Yep. But, That's one you know, of the only ones that I can remember where they've actually reversed the decision. Well, exactly. You know, it, I think someone mentioned, was it Finbar or somebody said, you know, it's almost like a batsman. They should get the benefit of the doubt. You know, you go with the umpire's call if it's inconclusive, the original call. But, no, apparently not. It, it went with the theme of the day of us getting the wrong the umpires stick yeah. for the whole day, really. You know, you I wouldn't know say they were woke. No, they weren't. But you know what, I'd take that one, seeing that the Crows missed out on a video review, so I, I think that worked out. All, mm. Worked out well. All good, yeah. yeah. Rick, what about you, mate? Love and hate. Uh, Macca, I was a big fan of the Wingard, or Wingard's hands. I thought his hands in the in congestion were, were fantastic, and it was just a sign of the future for us and really was spoiled because, I mean, Robbie Gray's got great hands and that, that handball that almost resulted in a great uh, goal to Wingard uh, in the uh, second or last quarter, one of the two, was uh, would have been one of the handballs of the year if it came off. But I thought Wingard's uh, clearance work, uh, his quick hands, his flick over the shoulder, um, beautiful, just, you know, very... Uh, 
um, pure footballing, almost rustly but handballish, uh, the way he's uh, firing those off. And I'm just very excited about what he's going to present as a midfielder in the years to come. And what about your hate? Uh, I'm sort of going with Harold here with the with the umpires, but mine was uh, uh, the lack of attention to detail. It was, you know, I was quite often uh, sitting at the southern end. I was just sort of as I was as I was doing. I was a bit bit drunk, had too many beers, so I wasn't really watching the game, <laughs> watching the umpires, and and uh, you know, they just they weren't really bringing the players back to where they actually. They were just play, setting them where they finished. They were letting players creep over the mark, um, you know, not bringing them back. Do your bloody job properly, boys. Tango wasn't happy, <laughs> and she was uh, very upset at the game, <laughs> and, uh, and so was I. I mean, I think it cost Jay a goal. It just stretched him out a little bit far, um, but, uh, yeah, that's my gripe. Yep, that's cool. fair enough. There's my, uh, there's my chocolate honeycomb mm. delivered. Mm. Lovely. Mm. There you go. Yeah, good on you, Rick. Stuff. <laughs> Look, my love this week. My love this week is the fact that we can kick 19 goals with uh, Robbie Gray, Chatty Wingard, and Matty White kicking zero between them. They only ended up ended up with uh, what two behinds between them, and they're second, third, and fourth on our goal kicking ladder at the moment. It just shows that we've got such a diverse forward line um, with so many different avenues to goal. What about your hate? My hate is uh, the Maggies losing. You know, I've gotten so used to them winning yeah. every week this year, and uh, they had a little bit of a mishap on the weekend. But never mind, I'm sure they'll get back on the winner's list again next week. We did have I a pretty it. depleted squad, though, didn't we? We do, yes. Yep. Mm. It's, uh, it's getting more and more depleted by the sounds of it, but uh, that's all right. I'm sure we can keep winning. So, Harold, while you're on the on the podcast, what's your... Um... What's your prediction for the rest of the year? So we'll put you on the spot quickly in, in 30 seconds. Where do you reckon you're going to see us finishing up? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not the best person to ask. I'm a real pessimist. I never like counting chickens before they're hatched, so to speak. Um, I think we'll definitely win the majority of our games and I'll be extremely disappointed if we're not top four. But I really don't want to say more than that because I think we do have quite a few... I don't know if they're 50-50 games, but games that I'd, I'm pretty sure we're not a shoe in. You know, Gold Coast away, that'll be a, a bit of a challenge. I mean, I think we should win the majority of our games. I don't think we'll beat Frio away. Mm. Even this week, you know, I'm worried about it. You know, I, I'm a bit uh, cocky at the moment, but as soon as we get closer to the game, I'm going to be Mr. Pessimism again, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I think the next two weeks are crucial. I think if we can get over the Crows and then get over Essendon at home, yep. that puts us in a really, really strong position. The games we should win, yep. and we really need to win them. We got the power to win, power to roll. Come on, we are the power from both. Let's get on to our AFL review. Uh, we had a little bit of a shaky start, but we went back, uh, whoops, sorry, we went bang in the second half, and we won by 72 points, 19 goals, 14 to 8 goals, 8. Uh, the big Schultz are the star with uh, 8 goals, uh, Hoff back in form with 3, and uh, the captain, Travis Boat, kicked 2 goals as well. Harold, do you want to give us a, a bit of a quick rundown of, of what happened on Saturday? Yeah, look, uh, like you just said, Macca, you know, we started slowly, and then there was that beautiful uh, set play, you know, that pinpoint kick in from Pittard that allowed White to run onto the ball through the centre square and a precision pass to Shules and goal, you know. Two disposals, really. I suppose it's three if you count the kick in, but, you know, Jasper won't get a stat for that. So that was absolutely glorious. Great. Yeah, it's nice to see that, um, you know, work for us. And then I thought, um, you know, we're a bit slack defensively early and our disposal, especially by foot, wasn't really up to scratch. Um, you know, we had a couple of goal-scoring opportunities from, I think, Robbie and Gus, who normally would nail those shots at goals and they didn't get them. And I thought we were beaten a little bit at times in the contested situations and I think we were a little bit lucky at the end when the quarter-time siren went and saved us from being a further goal down. Yep. We certainly wouldn't want to repeat that effort, you know, that first quarter effort uh, next week. No. And then I think, you know, Ken obviously told some whole tr- uh, home truths um, during the break and, you know, and then we, just, you know, started dom- dominating the inside 50s and 
eventually goals were being scored instead of behinds. And, you know, I love Schulz's uh, fortuitous soccer kick four that landed straight into Hoff's lap. And then it was even better to see Tommy Jonas score his first AFL goal, resulting from, you know, Polex quick bounce up off the ground after he took that sliding mark and, you know, he directed the pass, which almost forced the hitman to, you know, run a little bit further forward and mark well within kicking distance and, you know, Tommy nailed it and that was really beautiful and then from half time onwards, as you said, you know, Port Adelaide completely dominated the game. You know, we we were a little bit lucky that, you know, this week it was our opponents getting the injuries and not us and, yep. you know, Losing Griffin was a huge blow to them. Absolutely. But in, in hindsight, he probably shouldn't have played anyway, you know. So, um, And then the last quarter was just so enjoyable and it seemed like uh, all we were doing was trying to provide Jay Schultz with as many goal-scoring opportunities as possible and four <laughs> well, goals in that Schultz last quarter. Yeah, that was wonderful, that was wasn't it? That was yeah. I got, I got I think... caught up. I was at the southern end and couldn't help myself. We all joined in. Surely we all joined in. Absolutely. Yeah, and those four goals. Are, he deserves know, like, it. No one deserves it more. We know that. Mm. Yeah, and so, you know, those four goals in the last quarter was like icing on the cake of a good percentage boosting win. And we probably should have even scored a few more goals than that because I thought we squandered a few chances. But no, it was a really enjoyable last quarter. And I just uh, noted from the presser, you know, Ken's after game presser, that, you know, he said something like, you know, 56 points is. Uh, against is a good result and I thought well it certainly is a good result especially when you kick a hell of a lot more points than that to win so yep. it was all good it was we're probably, we're probably a victim of our slow start obviously for the uh, the score differential in the end I mean you're right we probably should have been a little bit more in front but I guess it was an over a 90 point turnaround at the end of the day so uh, that was a good swing I think Macca and Harold, the, the thing we need to keep an eye out on is, uh, I, you know, I noticed that the stats, we overpossessed the handball in the first quarter, and it seems to be a lot of teams now are trying to really congest us around the contest. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Start, especially at the start. I think start we get sucked into that as well, a little bit. I mean, we, we often give one or two handballs too many. Yeah. I think a quick kick forward would, would be a good thing. Um, and that's yeah. definitely something that I noted in the first half was that you know, we just kept getting, you know, stuck in these sort of six, seven, eight handball long, you know, strings yeah. where we just needed to get the bloody ball on the boot, get it yeah, forward. It's too many. Yeah. You're asking for trouble. It, yeah. it was a split. I think we were like 100 and 100 for possessions, kicks to handballs. So our, our, our ratio was a bit out. And, uh, yeah, that's not I right. guess that's where they – and I think they're trying to handball their way through the congestion, but um, they need to sort of get a bit more of a direct route which obviously they rectified in the second half and, yep. uh, that, and that showed on the scoreboard and probably halfway through the second quarter. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's something they need. the boys need to uh, uh, to work on, I think, and uh, and try and fix uh, over the coming weeks, especially against the better sides because, you know, you, get, you over-possess against a Frio or a, um, or a Hawthorne or a Sydney in form, uh, they're going to take you down. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, let's have a quick chat about... Uh... Rick's favourite person, Jasper Pittard, because he had an interesting start to the game where he had that uh, that fantastic um, kick in, as you spoke about earlier, Harold, um, which ended up in a, in just about one of the quickest goals uh, end to end you'll ever see. Um, and then five seconds later, he, <laughs> he tries to have a bounce, <laughs> it doesn't come up. If that doesn't just sum up Jasper Pittard in, in the space of about 90 seconds, then I don't know what does. But yeah. look, credit to him. He got absolutely blasted last week by, by a lot of people um, in social media. Um, and for him to come out after making that bad error in the first quarter, it, it could have very easily gone south for him. But he, he took the game on and he was absolutely fantastic for the rest of the game. I think it's a bit of a joke that we're even talking about at Macca. I... Um, <laughs> I mean, well, did anyone see the man, the 300-gamer, GNC Cruiser try and bounce? Uh, and what happened to his bounce into the goal square? Um, you had uh, Alipati Carlisle. He tried to bounce. And, and what happened with that? And, it's it's um, going to make a good keystone. It wasn't good. It's like the no. keystone cops, that highlight reel, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, there's... Look, I mean, obviously, Carlisle should never bounce again. <laughs> <laughs> he should never have a shot for goal either. But, no, he's um, true. He, you know, he's a defender that thinks he's uh, he can do special things, and ultimately <laughs> that he can't. But you never know. 
But uh, I think it might have been just the perils of Adelaide Oval and the, the vagaries of the bounce and the oval ball. But, I mean, the fact that, you know, he was lambasted still by certain people just for that one error. I mean, I could think of Matthew Broadbent where a lot of people actually thought he had a fantastic game. If you review the game, there was a couple of very, very risky kicks where he sent them to um, a con- contested uh, player in the middle of the ground uh, and turned it over, which was highly oh, risky. And yeah, and if that was Jasper Pittard, you know, the forum would have been in meltdown for two weeks saying <laughs> it's a disgrace and he's t- he takes too many risks and he can't execute, blah, blah, blah. But his kicking overall for the game, I thought short or long was pinpoint and very accurate. And it's usually his short kicking which can let him down. But overall, his kicking was fantastic and he was confident. Uh, get the the only there. reason why I, I brought it up was that Often, I think, when Jasper makes a, a mistake early, he can drop his head. And often, another mistake happens and then another mistake. But it was really good to see him, you know, after he made that, that bad bounce, about three minutes later, he really took the game on and had a big run down the wing, took a bounce, took the uh, took the opponent on. It came back. And ever since that moment, he was absolutely fantastic. And one of our best players on the ground. Yeah, he was flawless, really, wasn't he? Yeah. But I'm going to disappoint you, uh, Rick. I've got a really big criticism of Jasper. Ah, ah. Yeah. When is he going to get rid angry of that? Already. Yeah, but when is he going to get rid of that ridiculous moustache? I love the moustache. <laughs> it's a shocker. What about the ink that's slowly creeping? <laughs> creeping <laughs> yeah, that's not so good either. <laughs> I'm it's hoping like gang- it's like gangrene going up his leg. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hoping. I'm putting. I keep putting calls out. I'm, I want to get Jasper on the podcast. Hopefully. Um, Hopefully I can get him on before the end of the year. One thing that I thought was uh, was quite interesting was that, uh, once again, we tried to play a, a loose man, a plus one in defense, but the Bulldogs didn't allow that to happen. They they had a seven-man forward line going on uh, for mm-hmm. quite a bit there. Um, and it seemed to really work against them because it really opened up our forward line and it gave us so much space to work into. And I think that's half of the reason why we won by so much. Yeah, I think you might be right there. I, I do think, you know, them losing Griffin, you know, really stuffed them up. He was giving them so much drive. Yeah. He had 14 touches in, what, uh, about 28% game time or something. So he was he was definitely their best player on the ground at that point. Um, I think it's important to note uh, some of the defensive jobs that we did on the weekend. Um, Kane Corns was absolutely brilliant on Tom Libertore, who we yeah. spoke about a lot on the preview podcast as being one of the form players in the competition. He kept him to, uh, I think, his second lowest disposal count for the year. Um, we managed to keep Luke Dalhouse to his lowest disposal count for the year, which was Pittard's job. He did a fantastic job there. Yeah, it's almost like he wasn't there, Dalhouse. Yeah, he was absolutely anonymous on the weekend. Um, you know, Stuart Cramery, he didn't have a scoring shot. You know, Carlo absolutely took him to the cleaners. Um, you know, we just did so many great jobs on the weekend. You know, Trengove on Jones. You know, we just completely shut down their 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 midfield. Uh, you know, their contested midfield players, um, yeah. and also their forward line as well. Yeah, they had I'm no just forward wa- line. I'm just watching the um, the replay. We're into the third quarter, and it was good to see that Brad Ebert took the uh, the swinging elbow approach that Sydney had against us the week before. <laughs> where, he shattered, where he shattered Grant's nose. But it was quite noticeable how often Sydney were actually swinging their elbows to try and get out of a contest. So, um, yeah. I yeah. thought the other notice, noticeable thing too quickly was, uh, just going back to that first quarter, our prime mid- midfielders were also down with the uh, amount of ball that they were getting too. Yeah, I was just going to say they made an effort. They really were, they were tagging uh, Pollock, weren't they? You know, they Mitch and, Wallace did a fantastic job on Pollock. He yeah. really shut him down for yeah. a lot of the game, and it was only when Pollock, uh, sorry, when uh, Wallace went to Wines in the third quarter, where Pollock really started to get off the leash a little bit. Um, you know, Wallace did a fantastic job and absolutely gave him zero space. But credit to Pollock, I thought, despite the fact that he was having a really rough day, he didn't drop his head once. You know, he kept on working, kept on trying to get the ball as much as possible. Um, so I think uh, he deserves a lot of credit for that. A lot of other players might have dropped their heads and, you know, done something a bit silly. No, yeah, I agree with you. All credit to him. And when he, you know, had, when he got a char- his chance, he re- had a real impact. He went back. Not only yeah. that, yeah, that pass to uh, 
Jonas, but then, the, the, like I mentioned before, that beautiful goal that he, and he kicked with the 1-2 with Wingard. It was yep. just glorious to watch. Ebert was another one that had a, a pretty rough first half. I thought he, he really struggled just to not only get the ball, but do something useful with it. But he was another one that, uh, that really came to the forefront in the second half. He's had a strange year, hasn't he? He's been brilliant at times and a bit quiet in others. Mm. I don't know if he's been a bit sick at times or something. But... I think it was more. I, th- I think it was more a bit play. I think. I think Hickley really made uh, an effort to push Wingard up into the uh, midfield contest a bit more, and obviously uh, Ollie Wines had a fantastic contribution in one of no. his best, uh, if not best, AFL game as well. So I wonder if yeah. Hinkley was just giving the younger boys a bit more exposure to the midfield rotations. No, you've hit the nail on the head, Greg. Yep, that's exactly what was happening. It was a good opportunity to do that, and Ken took it. And how, how good were they? I mean, I know there was they an article great. on Ollie Wines. I mean, their sta- his second-year figures are stacking up bigger, uh, bigger and better than uh, Judd and Selwood at the moment. And the guy's just a, a man mountain, and uh, Wingard's just a freak. He's a machine, Ollie Wines. I, I just can't get over the fact that he's still, what, 19 years old and just performing like an absolute seasoned veteran and just doing all the hard stuff. You know, 11 clearances. I mean, that's just phenomenal. There was a post um, on the forum. We are talking about the list management today. Actually, I think it might have been when Trengo, on the, the Trengo re-signing thread, and uh, they were saying in uh, three years' time he'll be 26 or something, and then they were going through all the players and how old they'll be, like some of our players and all our key players that are influential now, you know, like Broadbent will be like 26 and all our other young players will be around 23 or 24. They're all going to be in their prime. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, they're, it's they're, not even in, they're not even in their physical prime yet, you yeah. know, which is just staggering when you put it that way. I mean, Westhoff will be 30 by the time Tringo's contract's up. So you could conceivably see him playing until then. Um, you know, Homsch would only be 24 or 23. It's, just, it's amazing when you put it into a perspective like that. Yeah, it's nice. Absolutely. Mm. A lot of hope. Now, Matt Dooley, how did we see yes. his game on the weekend? I thought he was absolutely fantastic. Just his ruck work and his quality of hitouts was uh, just about as best as I've ever seen it. No, I agree. Yeah, my daughter doesn't call him Prince Harry anymore. It's now King Harry. <laughs> and and he really is just about the most important player on our list, you know, especially seeing that we don't have any backup really besides, you know, Jacko. But I liked how Ken gave him a bit of a rest in that last quarter. Mm. And even though he did, I still thought he was in our best players. Oh, definitely. He had a real influence. Yep. So what about the boys really didn't skip a beat with the, uh, the three omissions and the three replacements? Uh, you know, it was just... As per normal, wasn't it, really? Well, yeah, I think so. I thought Sammy Gray did a, a reasonable job. He probably frets a little bit too much with the ball at this point. I think he doesn't realise he has more time with the ball sometimes than what he's actually got, and that can lead to some uncontested errors. But, you know, I thought he played pretty well, um, and that allowed Robbie Gray to, to play the whole game in the midfield, and he just dominated again. Yeah. How many games has he played? Three? Four? Sammy Gray, yeah, yeah about five. Yeah. Now, I think, yeah, yeah. So, but I think no, that'll come in time, and I think he's definitely sure. worth a, a little bit, uh, a little bit more of a look. K so, Mitchell's probably one that, you know, probably disappointed a, li- a little bit. I thought, um, as I spoke about Pittard before, where sometimes it, when he makes an early mistake, it can it looks like it plays on his mind a little bit. I thought Mitchell made a couple of errors in that first quarter, and he didn't mm. recover. Yeah, he, he's a bit fumbly. Isn't he? I think he's another who's you know he's young in AFL experience and just doesn't have the confidence just yet. To me, he seems like he lack he does he lacks the confidence with the physicality of the game. He um, you know I was watching him close in that first quarter and he he just doesn't seem to want that physical contact. Uh, and I'm not saying he's a coward or doesn't want to do the hard things, but he just seems to want to avoid the body contact and. Uh, if he can, and you know, if we go back to the Jasper comparisons, you know, at least that's one thing with Jasper. He'll put his body on the line. He'll go back, and he'll take the hit if he needs to. Um, whereas I'm not convinced that uh, Kane's willing to do that hard, uh, those hard yards if he has to. But then he put his body on the line and got absolutely hammered against Hawthorne in that and bounced yeah. straight up. And mm. um, maybe that's still playing on him. 
because I haven't really noticed that in Kane's game except for probably the last two or three weeks. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think he's got a lot of. I think we can criticise him about a lot of things. You know, you know his skill set. You know, he can't really take a contested mark and things like that. But I think with with time he'll be much better at that. But you just wonder if there's with our depth now. You know, he's got to make every post a winner. I thought he was given an opportunity on Saturday, and he really didn't grab it and make it his own. Not in my mind, anyway. But you know, I'm no expert. His numbers were still pretty good, but yeah, just his quality of disposal just wasn't up to it, I thought, on the weekend. Um, and as you said, he, he's a little bit fumbly. He probably lacks the polish uh, to make himself a long time, uh, long-term time, long AFL player. Yeah, well, Ken was very uh, animated at Mitchell uh, at the three-quarter time break. Sort of not the animation of where you're saying to a player, look, you've done everything we've asked you to do, but we're going to put you on the bench for the, <laughs> for the last quarter. It didn't seem to come across that way. No. No. You know, the other, um, the other interesting fact I learned from the weekend as well was if you're a defender and you give Jay Shields half a metre, he's going to burn you. Yep. It, was amazing. it was amazing how he either created himself a little bit of space or the defender just gave him that one metre or half a metre and that's all he needed, and he clunked them from everywhere, left, right, and center. And you know, unstoppable. It was fantastic, yeah, it was fa- a fantastic performance. I mean, they are massive numbers. Eight goals, two. He had fourteen marks. He had ten marks inside fifties, and uh, and six contested marks. I mean, they're massive figures. And I, and I just felt that the Bulldogs just completely shut on their own doorstep. Really, <laughs> as I spoke about earlier, where they. They decided to man up on our spare man in defence. I thought they really needed someone trying to drop back into the hole in front of Schultz, and they just didn't do it the whole game. Mm. Yeah, they, they didn't have the players to do it, I don't think. And uh, some of the delivery was spot on. Yeah. Broadbent's long oh. pass in the last quarter, and I think there was another one from, you know, Chatty, and some of the delivery was absolutely beautiful. I know we spoke about uh, a few weeks ago that we were um, a little bit disappointed that we weren't seeing Schultzy lead towards the bowl and that sort of thing mm. um, for a few weeks there. But, you know, I think he's absolutely solved that issue. Yeah, he's back to his best now. And if you're talking about his marks inside 50, but what about just in the game sense? I think we had 25 marks inside 50 to their five. Six, um, yeah. Six. I mean, that's just ridiculously good efficiency, um, you know. And we've been not that good, but we've been dominating that statistics um, against nearly every team this year. Um, you know, and it, it just show. And that means they're set shots at goals that we're getting that the opposition aren't getting. And it, I mean, it's just fantastic play by our, our coaches and our um, our players at this point in time. We provide a lot of space in our forward line for our forwards to do their work, which is fantastic. We push them all out. We allow them to run back with the flight of the ball, um, and it does lead to a lot of marks inside 50 and, and genuine scoring opportunities. Yeah, it's nice seeing that sort of football, isn't it? Mm. It's beautiful when it comes off. Definitely. And I, I think the other thing that we're worth mentioning is um, Robbie Gray's uh, now second seven points behind uh, Gary Ablett. In the uh, Coaches, Coaches Association Award, beautiful, and, yeah. great but, recognition, uh, isn't it? But he, I think he's behind three Crows players in the Merv Agar <laughs> Medal. It's, uh, it's a shame that um, you know we we just don't have the players really to just to push up that barrier of the Merv Agars. It's just a shame, but maybe one year it might happen. Yeah, well, but... it does make me worried this week that we're going to lose to the Crows. Yeah. I mean, clearly be. their best players are better than our best players. So. Yeah, it's just it's just ridiculous how good they must be. Like, it's just scary. Yeah, well, I mean, what a, the, what what a, were the pointless, sorry, what a pointless medal the Merv Agar's yeah. medal is. Absolutely mm. pointless. Yeah, but, It's just pointless. Well, either that or the coaches have got it completely wrong and <laughs> Capel is the greatest expert going around. So, I'm sure he would think that. Yeah, yeah. so I, I don't think that's the way it is, though, is it? No. I think the coaches are right on the money, actually, with their voting. Generally. Yep. No, I, agree I, with that. I think Rob It'll is It'll be interesting about to this. see what happens in, uh, on Brownlow night. Yeah, that will, well, that's a bit like the Merv Agars. Mm. So it can be a bit. So who got the, um, who got the play, uh, coaches' points this weekend? Sure, I, I, I didn't 
Shields got 10, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I've got it here actually. Uh, Wines, eight. Gray and Westhoff both got four. Boak, three. And Broadbent, one. So you're a good okay. judge, Macca. Yeah, can't disagree with many of them. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's a good pretty close. Yep. Well, look, as we're talking about best players, we might, a bit, might as well talk about ours as well. Rick, who are your best players, mate? Yeah, it's um, it's very hard, Macca, this week, because, um, you know, I should really give it to Jay Schultz, but I want to give it to uh, Ollie Wines, because I just thought he was... Uh, massive in the game and I, I thought even for as good as Jay was we, he was sort of looked after a little bit with the um, you know with his uh, uh, output the players really tried to uh, get his numbers up uh, but I had Jay second best on ground because it was a you know and club equaling record performance behind the great Warren tread race so you know it has to be acknowledged um, you know I had Chin- Chad Wingard third I, I thought his uh, midfield game was uh, you know, just beautiful again. And uh, I had uh, Travis Boak, fourth best. And, uh, you know, did throw a, throw a blanket over the rest, really. I mean, uh, it's just like shelling peas, which one you give it to. I'll give it to Tommy Logan because I thought he had a fantastic game uh, coming back. Yep. You know, and, and it should be recognised, you know. For, I know I've been a critic of Tom in the past, but, you know, last year and, and what he's shown in this one game this year and what he's done in the SNFL, you know, credit to him and what a great, um, club man he's become. I'd keep him Selfless. in on that performance, and I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be letting Dom back in the side, to be honest. This no, he's well. He's become this, a selfless club man. I mean, I thought that article um, on him last week before he got selected about. You know, he knows his role and he's willing to nurture the the players and just do what Ken wants him to do. I mean, what else can you ask? I mean, Ken would be very happy to have a couple of senior players like that. You know, not bitter about not playing every game and just doing what they have to do. I mean. Hats yep. off to him. Yeah, going Absolutely. back to what you were saying about the ins, he was like the perfect replica for Cassisi. We lost nothing with Tommy coming in, so no. I agree. It's going to be hard for Don to get back in and why not have an extra week uh, rest? Mm. Indeed. Harold, what about your best players, mate? Look, I agree with Rick. Uh, Ollie did it for me. He was, you know, great, consistent four-quarter effort. He's a competitive beast, you know, he's, uh, he just refuses to be beaten, he's team orientated, he's a clearance king, and you know, he's a real um, one percenter too, he's a cross the T, dot the I sort of a guy, you know, anything he can do to contribute to the team he does, and I thought that was really funny when, um, you know, big wolves like Roughhead tried to rough him up, you know, with a bit of macho push and shove after Ollie's goal assist to Westhoff in the third quarter, and you know, as if anyone could ruffle Ollie's feathers. You know, nothing phases that boy. Yep. So there's a lot of man love for Ollie, for sure. Schulze, you know, what can you say? I, I'm just going to quote something from his statement on the aftermatch presser where he said, you know, we love playing footy and we love competing and we love competing against the best sides. You relish every game you play in and every win you have you really want to achieve. And, you know, I think when I hear that, I think, you know, supporting Port Adelaide is just a great thing at the moment. I mean, you know, compared to the days when we had certain players saying, you know, we should be thankful with, uh, you know, and satisfied with losing performances. This is yep. the complete opposite. So, you know, he, he was brilliant. And thank God the Hoff is back. It was mm-hmm. great to see, you know, his brilliant marking, uh, elite disposal uh, efficiency for a man of his height. And I just how he love his evasive skills he's almost going in slow motion but no one can touch him it's great to see him back and you know most importantly kicking goals when he's got the opportunity to do so um i, I put Loby in it was in another one of my best players we've already talked about him and i i couldn't split robbie or boak for fifth best but you know really it was a just about all played well today you know the entire defensive unit was great so what yep. about you, Macca? It really was a case of all played well. And look, I've got uh, my top five, and really each one of those five could deserve to be best on ground. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have uh, Jay Schultz as best on ground. I just can't overlook his 14 marks and eight goals. You know, it was just one of the ultimate uh, key forward performances we've seen from a Port Adelaide player at AFL level. Um, I had Ollie as second best. He was probably, yeah, 
vying for a best on ground. If only uh, Schultz had a kicked a couple of less goals, I guess. Um, but you know, he did all the all the grunt work in the middle. He was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Brody, who we haven't really spoken about a lot on this podcast, I thought he was just about unstoppable um, on the weekend. You know, he was just in the right spot at the right time every time. You know, he, he did so much work in uh, in cutting off those uh, opposition attacks, and I thought he he delivered the ball pretty well and, and used his run to advantage. Um, Matty Loby, he just controlled that uh, that ruck duel against uh, an all Australian ruckman in in Will Minson, mm-hmm. um, who's been in pretty good form himself this year. And he just took him to the cleanest, like uh, like nothing else I've seen. He just absolutely killed him. And I'm going to give Kane Corns the uh, the one vote there for his uh, fantastic job on Tom Liberatore. Yep. Yes. I mean, we, we've barely spoken about Bobby Carlisle, who kept uh, Cramery scoreless. No, I love um, this game. Robbie Gray was great. Jackie Homsch was pretty good as well. Tommy Jonas was, uh, was back in good form. Um, I thought... Uh, Trengove was very, very good. Westhoff had a great uh, cameo in the first half as well. You know, we, we just had gun players all over the park on the weekend. Matthew White was brilliant in that first quarter too. He, he, he fell was, out yeah. of it, but he was He started brilliant. with a bang. Yeah. yeah. And I think we should also just quickly, um, even though Harold very briefly mentioned it, um, recognise Trengove signing on early uh, to the end of 2017. Uh, didn't have to. Yeah. Didn't have to. Could have gone next year. Uh, which could have then also, you know, become a bit of a distraction and, you know, the rumours start circulating, oh, maybe he's going to go back home, whatever, and he's just come out and gone, bang, boys, I'm here to 2000, at least 2007, eight. I mean, what a legend, you know, he's come on yeah. the podcast, he said he'll try and come on again for us, you know, what an absolute superstar and Port Adelaide club man. Absolutely. What a person, not just a player, yeah. what a great person he is. One of the ultimate Port Adelaide heroes. And no, I told him, he, yeah, he thinking. will be. Yep. Absolutely. I, I told him he has to grow that filthy beard back, and he said he's going to. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I love that bloody uh, beard he had going before. That was fantastic. It was good. <laughs> cheers, cheers, the black and the white. Honor the magpies day and by night. Live that All right, well, look, let's, uh, let's go on to the SANFL. It was our first loss since round one. We lost by 17 points, uh, 12 goals, 9 to 15 goals, 8. Uh, a little bit of a disappointing uh, performance there. Uh, Mason Shaw continued his good form with three goals. Yeah, I thought it was quite uh, impressive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Robbie Young was the only other uh, multiple goal scorer with two. Did Cracker have more of an influence this week, or was he a bit more subdued? Or I thought he was one of our better players. Yeah. Personally. I had a quick chat to um, uh, Brendan online earlier, and uh, he said he had a tagging role on the weekend, and... Um, had a bit of trouble getting the ball himself, but they, they've played him a few times as a tagger now. So yeah, he was made... better last week. There's no doubt about that. He he played a great game last at uh, the week before that. Sorry, I should say, but um, you know he wasn't shocking or anything like that. I thought he you know he, he was thereabouts. So... He was solid. Yeah. yeah, just couldn't couldn't get enough ball. But most yeah. of the players were down. You know, they're yeah. hard pressed to find you know critical players. Good. You thought do, you think was... they, do you think they're either a playing him as a tagger for a long-term view is where he might fit in, or are they b playing him as a tagger to try and get him to learn where to go to try and get more ball, following one of the better players in the opposition teams? Probably the latter, there, I would think. Yeah, part of his yeah. education. He was on Jared uh, against um, yeah. uh, WWT and. He's a pretty good player. He knows how to find the ball, so that would have been a good lesson. And he had a great game, so yeah. he, he, Jared saying, took him to the ball. I keep saying this ad nauseum on the forum, but I just think with our list profile, um, where Brennan was taken as an underage recruit or bottom age recruit, just seems foolish to um, sort of want to discard him sort of at the end of the year when he's still so young. Um, you know, he's really almost a year behind in the AFL system. Um, you know, I mean, we can carry him in our, with our list at the moment anyway. Um, the, and there's probably uh, older players that have had more of an opportunity that probably aren't going to improve. Um, and we, and I'll, I'll bang on about this too, we, we sort of get lured in with the Ollie Wines type that just make an impact so quickly and then seem to assess everybody else that 
is sort of around that similar age and, and not performing to that, to that level. But, I mean, Ollie Wines is a freak. And a lot of these young guys take a long time to, to physically develop and to get the confidence to perform. And, and that's why we start targeting these mature age recruits. And I think as supporters, we just need to be a bit more patient and, and give some of these young boys a bit more time to develop and build the bulk and get the confidence to perform at these higher levels. I'd love to keep him, and but I think he is one of those players that you know does come up in discussions because we've got a lot of depth now on our list, and it's uh, you know who are going to drop out. We have to drop three, and there's probably a couple of obvious ones, but you know I don't really want to talk about. It. And I would love to keep Brendan, and hope that we do. It's just you know three definitely have to go, and it's all you know what, what are we going to do with our rookie situation? You know, there's far greater minds than I that uh, will hopefully make the right decisions and we have signed those guys on, as Rick pointed out, uh, recruiting guys, so hopefully they know what they're doing. I think they do. Was Benny Newton's output down a little bit this week from the levels that he's uh, been performing at? He didn't have the quantity of bowl. He had 23 disposals and eight clearances, so he was probably our best player, I thought. Yeah, um, I agree. We got, we got. Absolutely smashed statistically, though, um, which is uh, not something we've seen all year, really. I mean, we had nearly 100 less disposals, 40 less marks, um, and the uh, the ruck situation is uh, is getting a, a bit of a concern. We had uh, Doesn't 12, exist. 12 hit outs to 42, um, so yeah. we were absolutely caned in the ruck. And, you know, we were playing Mitch Harvey in the ruck for most of the game, and, you know, that's really strange. not ideal. Yeah, I, I don't. Not sure why we're doing that. I think maybe Brueggemann's got an injury, or you know he can run around, but maybe not ruck because he'd be the obvious player to play in the ruck. You know, to do that grunt work, I would have thought rather than someone who's you know we've pinned a lot of hopes on for the future. There was yeah. uh, you know, and Mitch Harvey really did get killed in the ruck, but there was this. I think it was the second quarter. He, he was in the ruck, and then he made his way forward and clunked a beautiful mark and kicked a beautiful goal and you think, gee, this guy could be a real player. There's no doubt about it. So yeah. you don't want I him think, being killed in the ruck. No, I think they're trying to, to sort of um, even Build out that his... sort of ruck roll, I think, yeah, a little bit. So not to kill Brueggemann too early, yeah. um, you know, and try and share it around a little bit between Brueggemann, Harvey and uh, and Benny Harron as well. So you think you've also was... got Sam Gordon in the in the reserves who can ruck. Um, yeah, I think they should give it a go. Yeah. I, th- I think you, so. You think it was just Mitch Harvey's turn to do the majority of the game this, that week? I think so. I think that's yeah. what we're, we're trying to do. Um, I mean, that's going to probably be the key to us is making sure that we've got uh, some ruckman come finals time that uh, that can actually do the job, and um, that could be the one thing that sort of uh, stands in the way between us winning a premiership or not. Yeah, I think you're right. Hmm. Yeah. It really was that third quarter where. With the win, we just couldn't get any sort of advantage. Um, you know, Wessie's kicked three really quick goals and, and tore the game open. We were able to peg that that margin back, but um, we really needed something substantial heading into that last quarter, and we, we just weren't able to do it. Yeah, the endeavour was good all day, wasn't it? And, but you know, I think they were just far more effective and efficient. You know, they played the smarter game, I thought. Yep. And we did. It was a good learning experience, I suppose, but... Carl Amon, how did you see his game? Uh, he, he was in and out of it. I, I, I rate Carl. I think he's going to be a, a good player. Yep. Uh, but he's, um, you know, he's only a slight little fella, really, too. But he has a really nice kick on him, and he did end up with twenty plus disposals. And but I, I was a little bit frustrated with a lot of our players. I thought most of them were in and out. Like Jakey Need, I didn't even see him just about in the first quarter, except of well, first half except to do a few things wrong, and then he almost burnt it. You know, sorry, burned it. Had a great second half. Yep. Um, yeah. There's a few that, you know, had some nice little cameos. Robbie Young does some nice things, and it was good to see O'Shea get a bit more of the ball. Yep. But, oh, He's who, hit, hitting into some good form now, Cameron. Yeah, I agree. Cleary was one of the worst. You know, he's one of our best kicks but his kicking was shocking yeah. it was a very windy day there's no doubt about it but it was West it was just one of those days to forget was... I think yeah I think so 
But it's Hopefully not we nice look back and uh, look back at it as uh, maybe the loss we had to have. No, we, we, should have, we should have at least five AFL listed players coming back in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Stuart's yeah. close too. Stuart's so. close. Flynn will come back after uh, after next week, of course. Yeah, I think um, we missed him more. He, his run would have been vital in that game against West. Someone who could just yep. break lines and, and we didn't have he's anything a, like that. He's my most exciting player on the list, I reckon, Flynn. More than Pittard. Well, well second, <laughs> Jasper's not going to be happy with that, mate. Second most exciting player. Now, I, I, uh, I think he might be a bit more exciting than Jasper even, Rick. Yeah. Yeah. Take he, off his uh, rose-coloured glasses. Yeah. I reckon that he'll get upgraded at the end of the year. And, uh, and I reckon, so what uh, do you think? Do we have to – can we still just delist three and he's one of the upgrades? Is that how it works? Or do you think we'll be delisting more? I reckon we. I reckon we might do four. I, I think we are going to uh, probably draft um, three kids because we've got a young squad anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, we might. I think we might. Well, I think we have to look for another mature age ruckman of some form yeah, if we can. Most definitely. But don't you think, Macca? Oh, look, a ruckman's a uh, an absolute number one priority. I think. Well, I mean, I just don't see. Look, I think if we're going to draft, we're going to draft ruckman and forwards. But if we draft a ruckman. They're not going to be come in handy for us until five years' time, are they? Um, yeah, so we're going to need to look to trade for a mature age Rutman. Um, you know, as someone pointed out today, Renouf might have to stay on the list as well. Uh, but yeah, look, I think we'd have we'll probably uh, have to move on four guys, unfortunately. Um, you know, upgrade Flynn, have three, and then you don't know, we might do a couple of and swaps as well. I think we might leave it there for this evening. No dramas. Harold, no, that, that was great. <laughs> on your tango. Thanks for coming back on again, mate. Uh, always a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Can't wait for the uh, preview podcast now. Bring it on. Yeah, it should Bring be an exciting with. one. Indeed. Very exciting. <laughs> Hopefully you can get Jacko on. Well, let's um, not <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I'm, not hoping, uh, I'm hoping I'm uh, hoping. I asked Jacko if he'd come on to review the Essendon game, so fingers crossed. He, he, He's check his schedule and see what he's up to. <laughs> That's it. All right, boys. Thanks a lot, guys. Pleasure. Time. Yep. Go Port Adelaide. Go Power. Go Port Adelaide. Gray was brave, running hard, more getting forward. One last chance. Boat brilliant. Wines. Montfrey's centering ball. Cassisi. Hot wheel. <laughs> It's a freak.